gospel lesson comes from Luke 9, 28 to 42. <clears throat> About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. <clears throat> As he was... <clears throat> Excuse me. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in <laughs> Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. As they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless and at the time told no one what they had seen. The next day, when Jesus, Peter, John, and James had come down from the mountain, a large crowd met Jesus. A man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to take a look at my son my only child. Look, a spirit seizes him, and without any warning, he screams. It shakes him and causes him to foam at the mouth. It tortures him and rarely leaves him alone. I begged your disciples to throw it out, but they couldn't. Jesus answered, You faithless and crooked generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him down and shook him violently. Jesus spoke harshly to the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Well, it's an important day. It's the Super Bowl. It's even more important. It's Broncos at Super Bowl. Slightly less important than that is that this is Transfiguration Sunday. This is the Sunday before Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent. This is the end of the season called Epiphany when we see who Christ is through Jesus Christ. And this is the big moment, the big mountaintop moment. And you know the story, we do this every year. We've done this every year for about 2,000 years. We tell this story. And each of the Gospels has its own version. The basic part, there's basically, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the mountaintop. He's up there, he flashes bright white purity and, and spirit all through him and out of him. And there is Elijah and Moses, and they're talking together, and it's fearsome. And poor Peter doesn't know what to say, so he says, let's make booths for you. Let's, let's, make this, let's make this last forever. And then a bright cloud overshadows them, whoop, and they hear the voice saying, this is my son. Listen to him. Mountaintop experience, and we have those. We have those. You think back on your own life at some mountaintop experience you've had, that moment when everything came together. I remember when Matt was born, there in the delivery room, and he's, he's, he's pastel colored. Never saw that in the movies. There's pastel blues and greens and yellows and pinks. I did not realize how technicolor a baby comes out. <coughs> And I was awestruck by what God had done in that moment. We have retreats that are sometimes my mountaintop experiences. Some of you may have gone to walk to Emmaus. That is designed to be a mountaintop experience, and it ends with a mountaintop 
entry into what heaven must be like. I won't tell you, because if you go to it, you need to be totally surprised. Mountaintop. But the Emmaus walk, it's three days of that mountaintop, and then they have what they call the fourth day, and that's usually the Sunday after, or a couple weeks after, those who have been to the Emmaus Walk get together for a fourth day reunion with everybody who's ever been on that walk. And it's that valley experience. Because no matter how high the mountain, there's going to be a valley. And we wind up living there a lot more than we do on the mountaintop. In fact, that valley sometimes is so deep, it's a rut. And a rut is nothing but an open into grave. And Jesus and Peter and James and John come down from the mountain and they find everybody having a valley experience, a stuck in a rut experience with this young man who is, we would call epileptic, he is possessed. And his, the disciples can't seem to get it to work. They've studied with Jesus, they've learned all the right words, they've learned all the right things, but they cannot seem to get that demon out of this boy. And people are a little upset at them and at Jesus for not being there. Now, each of the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell the story, and they each tell this part a little differently. Now, during our study before, back in the fall, we took apart the four Gospels and looked at each one as it is. This time I'm going to mash them together and see what the combination tells us about living down here in the valley. Because that's what we have to do a lot. Luke basically has the shortest of the bunch and Jesus comes off as just perturbed. He is frustrated. He is tired. When is this faithless generation ever going to get it right? Okay, bring the kid to me. I'll take care of him. I will love through the midst of this. And the closing of, of Luke's telling, as we just heard, was, and the people who saw it were overwhelmed by the glory and power of God. Now, Matthew tells it a little differently. They come down and Jesus says, all you need is faith, the faith of a mustard seed. Little dab. It's almost like a computer. It's either on or it's off. Either you've got faith or you don't. It's, there's no, how much faith do I need? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You have to have the faith of a mustard seed. The tiniest amount. And then everything will work. And the, you won't have to go to the mountain. The mountain will come to you. You'll have those mountaintop experiences. And you'll get through the rut of the valley with just a little faith. And lastly, Mark, who tells the story probably as broadly as anybody, winds it up with, this kind of demon requires prayer. <laughs> He's not talking about the Lord's Prayer. He's not talking about holding your eyes, turning your eyes right and holding your mouth just right, and just working hard on the prayer. He's talking about prayer. And that means a constant relationship with God. And that's hard to do. Because when we get down in that rut, down in the valley, it's hard to see anything else. All we see is what's behind us and what's before us. And we really don't even see that. We just remember things about what's behind us and we just project them to what's going to happen in the future. And we are just sure that if our computer is stolen, someone's going to take our numbers and they're going to take our lives and they're going to steal from us and we're going to be ruined by it in that rut. Now Sherry and I found out there's another story that happens. And that's where somebody 
for some reason, drives all the way out here to bring that computer back. And that's a different story. I was telling my friend about that, and he said, well, when I hear your story, I know it's wonderful it happened to you, but I'll tell you my story. My story is we were going to, to a show to show our photographs. They have a photograph business. And I had the tin cash can. I put it on top of the car. And as we were driving and turning the corner out of our street, I heard a ka-chunk, and I thought something had shifted in the trunk. We got all the way there, and I looked, and we didn't have the cash box. And so we hurried back, and I looked and looked and looked, and it was gone. Now, there's a fire station across the street. Next to it is the city hall. Down in the basement is the police station. Everything you would need to very simply return it and find the owner. His name and address and phone number were on cards inside that cash box. <laughs> it wasn't until months later, after a snowstorm, the road crew had plowed the box up out of a snowbank, and somebody had opened it up, and they found the card. They didn't find any money. It was gone. He says, that's the way it happens for me. I didn't have the guts to tell him that's the way you remember it happening for you because that's the only prayers you say are the ones that are talking about everything going wrong. And when everything goes wrong in the past in that rut, what's the future going to look like? How do we get up out of the rut so our perspective can, can spread? My friend was also talking about the yin-yang, the symbol yin-yang. Got that here, there it goes, round and round and round it goes. Dark and light and light and dark. His reading is that sometimes you live, some people live in the dark part, like he does. And some people, some reason they're blessed, they live in the light part. I think everybody lives in the whole thing, and it goes round and round and round. Hypnotic, isn't it? Seeing how your life moves through these different things. This kind of demon requires prayer so that when we're in the light, we do remember the dark and remember it honestly. When we're in the dark, we remember the light, hopefully. So we move through life just in a valley and not in a rut. It requires prayer. It requires faith, and not much. Just a mustard seed of knowing where God is. Sometimes prayer is folding our hands and, and, and thinking and and talking with God. Sometimes it's writing it out. I've done this on a regular basis. When I'm in a real jam, it is time to write a dialogue with God. I have M for me and G for God, and we go back and forth. And I know it's just what I'm thinking God might say, but sometimes it is prophetic. And sometimes I look at it later and I said, how could I have known that? Because sometimes it is absolutely Scott's spot on when we spend time with the Lord. Open our hearts to him and open our ears to the possibilities that will get us through life when we're down in the valley.